Hello, everybody. We're just waiting for everybody to join us. Thank you for coming this evening. I see some people coming on in. We don't want anything cut off in our presentation, so I just wanted to wait another moment. Okay. Well, I think it looks good and we will begin. So, hello and welcome. I'm Stephanie Gaspar, president of Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society, and I want to thank you for joining us for our November 2020 monthly meeting. I'm happy to report that our meeting last month was a success and folks have already reached out to Dr. Forsman about the Purple Martin Project. This evening, I'm very excited to introduce Larry Rosen as our guest speaker. Larry held the reins as our former president for 14 years and is still an active board member. He is a retired Valencia College research analyst and he and his wife enjoy traveling our world when it is more normal. Additionally, he has been a mentor for the Audubon Florida's Conservation Leadership Initiative and has been supportive with my role as president even as I enter my second elected term. One of the things I like about Larry is that he is a wealth of knowledge and we could speak for hours about birds, native plants and everything in between. In 2018, he traveled to Africa and tonight's presentation will be about the birds and wildlife of Southern Africa. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. Do, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and keep up to date with our activities through our Facebook page and website. With that said, I will pass it over to Larry. Enjoy the presentation. Okay, good evening, everyone. So as Stephanie said, I'm Larry Rosen. Um, I live in Kissimmee, Florida. In October 2018, my wife Roz and I and two friends, Mike and Andrea, uh, took, a, took a trip to South Africa and Victoria Falls, which is between Zambia and Zimbabwe. And um, the trip was, uh, was through a travel company called Cheapers, C-H-E-E-P-E-R-S. And our main guide was Errol De Beer. For the, he was our bird and, and wildlife guide and took us around the country for the great majority of the trip until we went to Victoria Falls. So I'm going to begin the trip now. So this is a map of Southern Africa and the red stars indicate the places we, we went to. And so we started in, well, so what we have here is um, Johannesburg area, which actually was a couple of locations in that area for the first couple of days. Um, then we went to Kruger National Park to the Northeast. Then we crossed the country to Cape Town and spent some time there. Spent, went up to West Coast National Park, also on the Atlantic coast, uh, north of Cape Town and stayed there for one night. Came back to Johannesburg just to fly to, to to uh, to Livingstone, Zambia, where is, which is where we uh, were staying when, when we visited Victoria Falls. So the first stop, as I said, was Johannesburg area. The uh, first couple nights we were at a, a combination of a, a hotel in Johannesburg, and then in a Dino Kang Game Reserve, which is northeast of Johannesburg. First picture here is that this is a, a southern masked weaver. There are a lot of species of weaver bird in in Africa, and this is one of them. Uh, they construct these elaborate nests, weaving grasses and reeds, and they're pretty amazing. There are different the different species have different configurations for their nests. Some have little tunnels going into the nests, and others have the nests hanging from trees uh, from a fair distance. Um, others, um, a lot of nest singly and others nest colonially. This is a long-tailed widow bird. 
This is again in our first stop at Dino Canyon Nature Reserve. Uh, and this is a bird, this is a, actually a male who's going into breeding plumage now because it was October, which is Southern Hemisphere spring. And those black tail feathers were just recently grown. And he's on his way to, to um, replacing this brown plumage with black feathers, all what you can see it in the front here, uh, starting to come in. In a couple weeks after this, he's going to be an all black bird with a very long black tail and still keep these bright, the bright red and, and white spots on his wing. Down near the water, this is a black heron. And I, this uh, pose shows it shadowing the water with its wings, which some of our, our herons and egrets do here in Florida uh, to to reduce the glare on the water so that they can see the fish and things like that under, under the, underneath the water, which is their main prey. Here's a white-throated swallow, apparently gathering nesting material. Here's another one, apparently feeding a baby. Again, this was spring in the Southern Hemisphere, October. Glossy ibis, very common, fairly common bird here in central Florida. And one of the several birds we saw there that we also see in Florida, there weren't that many. This is a black winged stilt, uh, as opposed to our black neck stilt that we have here in the New World. This is a red billed, red billed teal, a kind of duck for you, for those of you who are not really birders. Squawk O'Heron. This is a red knob to coot, named after the red knobs on the head. And, and it's uh, swimming here with one of its youngsters. Unfortunately, it's probably the only youngster left. There's a lot of predation on young aquatic birds like that. Here's a gray-headed gull. This was definitely a life bird for me, as were most of the birds in the, on the trip. This one too, hot and tot teal with the blue beak. Here's an African spoonbill, not quite as showy as the roseate spoonbills that we have here in, in Florida, <clears throat> but um, nice bird nonetheless. And here's an African snipe, very much looks a lot like our snipes. This is the blacksmith lapwing. Uh, lapwings are, there's a, there's a number of lapwing species in Africa. You'll see uh, several of them in this slideshow. And uh, they are actually related to plovers. If you look at them in the book, their name includes plover in parentheses uh, instead of lapwing. If you want to call it, you could call it a blacksmith plover. They're very large though, long-legged. Um, there is a northern lapwing in the northern hemisphere. Uh, I don't know if it occurs anywhere in in uh, the United States normally. I don't think so. And um, I've seen it in uh, in Europe and and actually in Japan. Um, actually, I saw one also in Iceland, and they and they are not normally there. Um, but but those were northern lapwings. This is a blacksmith lapwing lapwing, one of the southern hemisphere species. Uh, plovers are shorebirds, so this, um, these are shorebirds that happen to nest and uh, forage for food inland very often, like on, on dry land, and uh, very much like are the killdeer in the United States. This is a Cape Long Claw. This 
Here's an African swamp hen. Uh, we have a similar bird in Florida that's a native bird called the purple gallinule. And it's also a very pretty bird like this one, gorgeous colors. Um, there's another uh, swamp hen called the gray-headed swamp hen or gray swamp hen, I think, um, that's actually from India and Southeast Asia that has become, has established, is establishing itself in Florida and po possibly other warm parts of the US. Um, but um, that is not an African species and there's no records of this particular species being seen in the US yet. This is a nice butterfly with clear upper wings. And I uh, couldn't find a common name for it other than Acrea. And there are several species of Acrea in Southern South Africa. I, be, I believe this is the Acrea horda. It, it looked very much, that, that's what it looked like to me. Here's a Cape Robin chat. And um, let's see the next bird. Here's a crested barbet. I was very pleased to see that there were barbets in Africa. I didn't know there were. It's one of my favorite types of bird from South America. And uh, they're pretty much all really gorgeous birds. And uh, this was a great one to find. Saw it a couple times during the trip. This is a common cuckoo. It's called common cuckoo because it's very common in Europe. <clears throat> it's the it's the cuckoo that you know from from cuckoo clocks and um, the sound that they're supposed to make. Um, I'm, I'm getting hoarse. Yeah, this. Um, in fact, when when Roz and I were birding in Portugal. We heard one, it sounded just like cuckoo, cuckoo, just like a cuckoo clock. Did not see it, however. So it wasn't until I got to South Africa that I actually saw my first one. This was in a botanical gardens near, near Johannesburg. Here's Cape Glossy Starling. Um, there are several, starling species in, in Africa, in South Africa. And um, this is a nice one. There's even better ones I'm going to show you later. Here's another species of cuckoo called Classis cuckoo. It was way up in a tree, beautiful green and white bird. This is a gray go away bird. It's actually bigger than it sort of looks in this picture. It's um, at least uh, two, two and a half times the size of a robin, maybe bigger than that. Uh, it's named go away bird because of the call it makes. It sounds kind of like go away, go away. White bellied sunbird. There's no hummingbirds in Africa, but they have these sunbirds that are quite Beautiful also. And like hummingbirds, they're nectar feeders. And he uses that hook beak to get in, into southern, certain flowers that are common in South Africa. This is an Egyptian goose. Um, a lot of birders from the US have already seen this in the US because um, they, are, they have sometimes escaped from captivity. Like here in Central Florida, we believe some escaped from Disney at one point. And um, so I, I saw one in Kissimmee where I live within the last two months, within a mile of my house. Here's a spotted thick knee. These are pretty closely related to the lapwings. There's, there's a couple of kind, kinds of thick knee in South Africa and there's others in other parts of Africa.
Here's another barbette. This is a black colored barbette. I saw at a distance in a tree. And this is the African sacred ibis. This was um, this 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 ibis is the one that's often depicted <clears throat> in hieroglyphics in e in Egypt, and um, and um, it like, as I as I said it went extinct in Egypt. It's still pretty common in South Africa. This is a pin-tailed wida. Little bird with a nice long tail. It's a common ostrich. Uh, ostriches actually are not um, not mostly native to South Africa. I'm not sure if this one is the native variety. Um, they they normally the native population is north of South Africa in Botswana and Namibia, dry parts of both countries, and the ones in South Africa, many of them are escapees from, from being farmed for feathers, which I'm not, I'm not sure if that still happens. And uh, this, and I, I'm not sure of the origins of this particular ostrich, whether it was brought in as a native African ostrich to this preserve. This was on the Dino King preserve. Here's another lapwing. Again, the type of plover. Uh, so it's, uh, this is called the crown lapwing. This is a crested Franklin. Franklins are related to quail and similar birds and, uh, or spur fowl. They're, they're, they're related to spur fowl with, there's a number of species of spur fowl in Africa. And this is a particularly nice looking Franklin. Another southern masked weaver in some very thorny vegetation that, that's, that weavers had nests in. And this was, this, uh, this is a southern pied babbler, pied meaning black and white. Um, and uh, this, they were they are babblers. This guy woke us up in the morning outside our room in Dino Kang Preserve. And these are probably pretty loud too. I don't remember. These are magpie shrike shrikes. <clears throat> okay. Magpie shrike. Here's a plain zebra. This, uh, you can see the plain zebras don't just have black and white stripes. There are some faint brown stripes in between here on the haunches. And uh, later in the trip, I, there's another picture of a zebra and I, and I did some research and I found that they're the same up at uh, Victoria Falls, it's the same species of zebra, but there's regional variation. Um, in coloration. The other one didn't, didn't have, it was very hard to see any brown lines on the other one. There are two other species of zebra. One's called the mountain zebra. And the other one is called the um, Gre Grevy's zebra. The Grevy's is up near Tanzania. And I, I believe the, the mountain zebra is on the west coast of, Flor of, um, west coast of Africa. So then we went, we drove back to Johannesburg and flew to Kruger National Park, which is delineated by this circle here in the northeast part of South Africa. Actually, it's near the border with Mozambique. That's what this is here. Uh, down in the wetlands, we saw an African jacana very pretty bird with the blue shield. Uh, the toes are very long on jacanas. Uh, just about all jacanas all over the world, they have very long toes. They're wading birds, but they like to walk on the top of lily pads and other aquatic vegetation. This water could have been pretty deep and it was probably just walking on this mat of, 
of vegetation here. Malachite kingfisher. That's the first kingfisher I'm going to show you, but there's others. Um, we have um, we have only one kingfisher that I the belted kingfisher in the eastern U.S. and uh, Africa has a number of kingfishers of different sizes and colors. Uh, these birds um, perch on branches over water or near water and then dive into the water when they see a fish. They just dive in, grab it, and come right out with a fish. This is an African darter. And people who bird in Florida know that this looks very much like our in Anhinga. And in fact, it's closely related. It's in the same genus, which is Anhinga. And uh, it, they off, it's often called snake bird, just like ours is, because it, it dives into the water and swims underwater looking for fish. And when it comes up, it's often, it often just has its head and neck above the water, kind of looking around. And it, and it reminds people of a snake in the water. And they actually spear their prey. They spear, they spear fish underwater with that sharp beak. And when they come up out of the water, they throw the they they throw their neck back so that the fish slides off their beak. And then they try to catch it head first so they can swallow it whole. And there that neck can take that mouth, little mouth and neck can can eat a pretty big fish. This is a great bird we saw on the on the uh, drives in, in Kruger, crimson breasted shrike. Shrikes are um, insect hunt, mostly insect hunting birds. That um, and uh, they might also eat small lizards. The ones here in the U.S. do. Here's a little bee eater. There's several species of bee eater in Florida, in, in Africa, excuse me. And, um, and uh, of course they, they eat bees often on the wing, they grab them on the wing um, and other insects, not just bees. Here's a golden breasted bunting. Southern yellow-billed hornbill. Very impressive beak, very powerful. Here's our first antelope species. Um, it's a steenbuck, very small. This, these are straight or these straight antlers are, are, these are, antlers or horns, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, horns, um, very distinctive of the steambuck. Here's our, our little red, red-billed oxpecker that's on the back of a larger animal and they hold on to the fur of these um, ungulates and other African mammals and, uh, and pick through their, their, their fur for insects, ticks, other kinds of insects that are either on the fur or on the skin of the animal. This, this particular one's a red-billed oxpecker. There is another species you'll see later. This is a niala, which is another type of antelope. Very elaborate horns. This bird is a red crested korhan. It's a pretty, it's a couple feet tall. Forages on the ground mostly.
He's a slender mongoose. And uh, he was on this pile of sand. I'm not sure whether he was foraging for food or not. That looks right here that he, like he might be tired and giving it a yawn. Here's our first eagle. Uh, this, is, this is a Wahlberg's eagle. There are a lot of species of eagle in South Africa. Um, it's, of course, good to have a book with you and a good guide. Uh, the, uh, I mean, our guide, Errol, was great. He could tell us right away what each bird was. Uh, this is the book that I took with me to South Africa. Birds of Southern Africa from Princeton University Press. And um, it's got pages, several, uh, I don't know, four or five, six pages of eagles with about five, five species on each page. And we saw these, these cuties uh, from the road. They were about 40 feet up a cliff in kind of a little cave in the, in the rocks. And uh, apparently, the, apparently their parents had left them there while the parents were out foraging for food. And, um, they, and we were about 100 to 150 feet away, I guess. The road was about 100 feet away from the rocks. And they got a little playful while we were watching. Here's a Marshall Eagle, a really nice looking eagle. Skipped one. Here's a Southern Warthog. You know, of course, when you go to Africa, you want to see Pumba. Here he is. And here's another one. Here's a white fronted bee eater. One of the prettiest birds we saw there. Uh, had this one on my cell phone for a while as, as like the background for a while after this trip. Vervet monkey up in the trees. They kept to themselves out in the trail where we were. At the resort we stayed at in Victoria Falls, they were kind of a nuisance. They were stealing people's food from the, the outdoor restaurant uh, tables there. And they, the, the guys would have, would have to chase them. The rainbow skink. Skinks are a type of lizard if you're not familiar with them. Here's the African fish eagle. You might think it looks a lot like a bald eagle, an American bald eagle, and it does. In fact, it's in the same genus as, as our bald eagle. It's the genus is Haliatus. And, um, and so it's very similar. It's the only eagle in Africa that's in that genus. Looks like he may be clutching a fish there in its talons. I'm not sure what it is. This looks a lot like the green heron we have here in Florida, but it's not. It's a green back heron, also called striated, striated heron. And um, it's another, it's also a very, very attractive bird, just like our green heron is. This is a Nile monitor. It's a big lizard, very aggressive when it has to be. Goes after bird eggs a lot. 
um, goes after turtle eggs, goes after goes after crocodile eggs in the Nile areas of, of Africa. And here's a closer look. Here's another kind of kingfisher. Again, they perch on branches and then dive into the water for their prey. They, they watch for fish and they have an amazing accuracy rate when they come out of the water. They, they often come out with a fish. Here's a gray-headed bush shrike. Here's a hem helmeted guinea fowl. Uh, these are often raised as sources of meat in some parts of the world. This is a wild one though. Here's another lapwing. <clears throat> this is the African waddled, uh, African waddled lapwing. And uh, hmm, looks like his eyes are blue. So let me give you a closer look. Yep, they're blue. Brown snake eagle. There's at least a, at least a page in this book on on snake eagles. We went on a night uh, a night tour in Kruger, and the the driver had a spotlight which she she shone on some animals, and this is one of them, the scrub hare. And this is a big poisonous, a big venomous snake called the puff adder. This is the white rhinoceros. Uh, as you can see, they're not really white. Uh, the, na the name white comes from a Dutch word meaning wide and it's a little bit hidden by the rock here, but the the their their the front of their mouths is is straight across, so that they the way the white rhinos feed is by grazing, which means they're pulling grasses and things um, from up up from the ground, and so their their uh, mouths are flat so they can get close to the ground. Uh, black rhinos, on the other hand, they're their, their mouths are much pointier in the front with like a per, almost prehensile lip so they can grab leaves from bushes and trees. So they, they actually are browsers, which means they, they, they forage in trees and bushes. But again, the white rhino is a ground, they, they feed off the ground mostly. Here's a little owl called a pearl spotted owlet. Very cute. Here's Roz looking out the windshield of our van. Um, and just to remind you that they drive on the right, drive on the left uh, in South Africa. So that's why Roz is in the passenger seat on the left side of the car. Here's a giraffe. I, I took this picture with my cell phone. We were really close to it. Another view of the giraffe. Oh, there's an oxpecker on the neck of the giraffe here. A group of elephants. A group of elephants uh, crossed the road in front of us, and then went 
uh, that just kind of group group together in a, like about 15 elephants together next to a tree. I'm not sure if they were in, in defensive posture. I didn't see any predators around, but uh, th that might've been why they did it. And you can see the babies here in the middle. And this baby was getting some, was, was get, able to get some milk from this female. <clears throat> and you can see the other, the smaller baby here on the right uh, trying to get in there, but he couldn't, he or she couldn't squeeze in. She practically climbed up on the other, put her, her, hind, her front legs up on the other elephant, baby elephant trying to get in. Here's another view. And uh, she said, uh, I'm gonna go somewhere else and just kind of walked out. <laughs> Lizard called a tree agama. Here's another one of the starlings, uh, another species of starling called the greater blue eared starling. Uh, as I, I may have said, I, I, w I wish the starlings in the, in the States look something like this. And by the way, they're not native to the US. They were brought from England in the middle of the 19th century, probably. Somebody had the bright idea to bring all the birds mentioned in Shakespeare's plays to the new world. Didn't work out so well for the native species. Uh, this was actually the second leopard we saw that day, the first photo I got, but um, we were actually eating a late breakfast around 10 o'clock, I guess, in the morning, 10 or 11 o'clock, because we'd, we'd been out all morning, and we were on the patio of a restaurant at Kruger overlooking the, a river, and it was a, we were about maybe as much as 100 feet above the river, and across the river, People notice this leopard skulking through the reeds. And I was able to stabilize my camera enough to get this picture. Uh, our guide said that, that, that uh, if you want to find a leopard, go near the water. They hang out there. It's probably where their prey tends to congregate. Here's a desert rose blooming. Here's a group of giraffe out on the veldt, as they say. Then I, while I'm on the subject of veldt, uh, they have what they call high veldt and low veldt because the, the big valleys, the big plains that the animals are on can be either at a fairly high altitude, well, not, not a tremendous altitude, but uh, one or 2,000 feet up, and it tends to be cooler than the low veld, which is closer to sea level. Here's a white-backed vulture going overhead. So we, we came upon this group of elephants that, that uh, decided to cross the road. So the babies either go in front of the, of the large females or like between them. You can see her watching, making sure everything's safe. And going along with the younger ones, younger ones, and an even younger one. And you might be surprised to see the younger one in the back because it's not very well protected. But guess what? There was a large female behind. And she was actually the last elephant in the group. So we uh, spotted these two lions and another one was right next to them. There's, there were actually three. 
And so they were arresting. It looked like they were pretty zonked out, maybe because they just had a meal. Don't know. Then all of a sudden, from the left and down below, this kudu comes bounding from the left and looks like he's going to come up this, this bank towards where the lions are and just freezes there. And it looked like it was terrified and didn't move an inch. And it was like frozen there, didn't know what to do. You can see the lions here on the, one of the lions uh, here on the lower right. And uh, it stood there for probably a good 15 seconds and then broke away and ran off to, ran off to, the, to, to, to the right of the frame here. Another leopard in that same basic area. It was moving pretty fast. Here's a southern ground hornbill. This one forages on the ground. I saw a couple of these at one point playing with some tortoise shells that looked like they were empty. Um, I'm not really sure if that's one of their prey, prey items or not. It probably is with a beak that big. Here's a baby white rhino we saw through the brush. It happens to have a red-billed ox, ox pecker right on its nose. Uh, this is a doiker. It's a type of little antelope that um, it's one of the smallest antelope. It's also pretty reclusive. Here's a tawny eagle. Here's another elephant foraging out in the field. Here's wild dogs. We came across one small pack of wild dogs. Uh, these are amazing predators. They, they run down their prey to exhaustion. Uh, they, can, they can take down fairly good sized animals. Um, large antelope, because they, they hunt in large groups normally, like maybe up to 30, maybe even 50, 50 individuals. Um, the family groups, they stay in family groups and hunt that way. Very efficient at digesting just about anything. They can, they can digest skin, fur, um, maybe, probably even small bones. It's the African wild dog. Here's another hornbill species. It's one of the tree hornbills, African gray hornbill. Here's a Cape Buffalo. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of plant pictures later in the presentation, but uh, the, I saw these in Kruger National Park. Um, th this is an aloe. Uh, it's, uh, there's many, many species of aloe in South, in South Africa. There are, um, these are this is this one kind of grows in, on a almost into a tree. It's got a stalk below here uh, that it's growing on, and um, no aloes originate in the New World. These they all come from I, they all come from the Old World, and I believe they all come from Africa. And South Africa is the origin of half the known species. I may have mentioned that of aloe. This looks like maybe a cactus, but it's not a cactus. There are no cactus in the old world, no cactus in Africa, uh, except for one species. Cacti are a new world group of, group of plants. Um, they're only in the Northern, North and South America and Central America. And uh, there is one species of cactus uh, they often call 
They often call it the mistletoe cactus because it, it gets white berries. <clears throat> and however it got to Africa, this one species of cactus, not this one that I'm showing, but the one, the, the, the mistletoe cactus, um, it's, it's different enough from the ones in the new world to have be its own subspecies, but not its own species yet. So the theory is that it came at least several hundred years ago to Africa, either on a ship somehow, or maybe uh, in a bird as a seed that somehow got across the ocean. So, um, nope, if you have a succulent that's from the old world, it's gonna be a euphorbia or some other kind of succulent that, uh, but it's not gonna be a cactus. Here's an orange breasted bush shrike. Common scimitar bill. Uh, they, they use this to uh, actually forge, they, this curved beak on the scimitar bill, it's not actually used for nectar. Normally they use it for, for, for uh, picking its way, their way through wood and other other places for, for mainly for insects. And this is a related bird to the scimitar bill called the African hoopoe. It's a gorgeous bird. Uh, this is the best picture I could get of it on this trip. And um, this crest actually can, can erect itself and uh, have individual orange and black spikes coming up and uh, we, so we did see a, there's a similar hoopoe species in Europe and Asia called the Eurasian hoopoe. Looks very similar. And when we were in Zimbabwe later on, on the trip, Roz couldn't, couldn't resist buying her own hoopoe made of beads and wire. Back at Kruger National Park here, um, lilac breasted roller. They're insect eating birds, beautiful birds. This is the real coloring. <laughs> That's a striped swallow. Very cooperative little pair. Spotted hyena, baby of course, very cute. The adults are not cute at all. Uh, this one was, uh, this, this one came out of, like, came out from under the road. There, there's a culvert going under the road, and that's where they had their nest. Two different species of oxpeckers on this Cape Buffalo. Red build on the left and yellow build in the middle. Southern white-faced owl. So this was the end of our four days in Kruger National Park. Uh, we stayed in two locations in, in the park at two, dif two different lodges. Um, two nights each. And uh, the lodges were, 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 de were pretty decent. I mean, the, um, the rooms were very small, but they had everything we needed and, um, and the restaurants were good and it was a really nice experience. Uh, this elephant did not want to let us leave. We were trying to get out of the park at like by 6 p.m. or so when the park gates closed because they have gates around Kruger National Park to protect the wildlife and also protect the people living outside the park. And um, this big male just didn't want to let us go. And uh, he did not turn his head toward us. 
uh, to challenge us or anything, but you can see he's got his, his trunk aimed toward us so he can smell what's going on in that direction, in our direction. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, he decided we could go. So he walked, calmly walked off the, off the road. And uh, we stopped at a restaurant once we were outside the gates. Um, we stopped at a, a, a little kind of a fast food place, which was, which was kind of nice. Uh, this picture is testament, testament to the fact that if you hang out in the parking lot after everybody else goes in, you might see something cool. And I got this at a really close range from the tree right above me. This is another kind of weaver. Did not see any nests nearby though. Red-headed weaver. So our next destination was Cape Town. So we flew to Cape Town, way down here on the southern tip of Africa. And uh, it's a totally different place. And you'll see that in a minute. So Feinbos is a, is a, I guess it's an Afrikaans language word. Afrikaans is the ad adopted kind of Dutch based language of the, uh, of the uh, settlers um, of South Africa. Um, and Feinbos means fine bush. Uh, referring to the small leaves and flowers that a lot of the species have. Um, there's tremendous diversity in the Feinbos and the Feinbos. It's also called the Cape Floral Kingdom. Um, and you'll see a slide about that later. Um, down here on this, on this particular slide, you can see that in the heathland communities, which are a type of feinbos, a type of uh, plant community. Uh, there's 94 species per 1,000 kilometers squared in this in this region, the Cape Floristic region. Um, 14 per 1,000 in Australia, 12 in California. The rest of South Africa only three. So it's very dense species diversity. Uh, one reason is because of the, again, the, the reason there's so many different aloe species and other succulent species is because, because South Africa's deserts or, or other dry areas have been that way for a really long time, unlike parts of the Sahara, which are quite new desert. And uh, so these uh, plant species have had a long time to adapt to the dry climate. So there's a lot of them and a lot of diversity. Here's another picture. This shows the world floral kingdoms. And a floral kingdom is basically a group of types of plant families that proliferate across certain regions of the world. And uh, the boreal region, which has some other names, but this, that's the green one, which looks like it's most of the Northern hemisphere. Neotropical, which is um, Africa, most of Africa and Ara Arabian Peninsula, India, and lots of Southeast Asia. Paleotropical, which is Mexico all the way down to Brazil. The, uh, the Australian, which is by itself, it's orange. The uh, Antarctic and Patagonian floral kingdom, which includes Chile and Argentina <clears throat> and uh, Antarctica. And way down here at the southern tip of Africa, the little, this little red spot is the Cape Floral Kingdom, very limited in, in area. So we, uh, one of the places we went to look for birds happened to be a botanical garden. In fact, two, two botanical gardens in Cape Town. And that was fine with me because I love plants. And there were lots of birds there too. Uh, this is a Hadeda ibis. It 
here's a cape white eye. You can see the leaves of some of this vegetation are pretty unusual by our standards. A swee waxbill, this is a female. The male's got more color, but this is really nice. This is some of the uh, plants in the Cape Floral Kingdom. Um, these are a kind of protea. Those protea that you see in, this is a king protea. Those protea you see in flower arrangements, they originate in, right here in South Africa in the, in the Fienbos, in the Fienbos uh, Floral Kingdom, Cape Floral Kingdom. Here's another species. Check that. Okay, that was right. Another species. Some of these are called pin cushions. I'm not sure which is which. I, I haven't studied this very much. This is a type of, of sunbird, female, probably an orange breasted, but I can't tell because the females look kind of alike. Here's a southern du double collared sunbird, really nice. African oyster catcher. We have American oyster catchers, they look a little different, have more weight on them. That's a nice plant, very unusual. And uh, this is Roz up on Table Mountain. We took a cable car to get up the table mount, not a cable car, uh, a, a lift kind of a cable, a cable lift uh, to get up to the mountain. And uh, this animal here is not a rodent. It's called a, a rock hyrax. And uh, rock hyrax is really unusual. <clears throat> They're kind of in a group all by themselves. In, in recent years, it's become clear that these rock hyraxes and manatees and elephants are, uh, all come from a common ancestor. Some of the evidence for that is in the genetic makeup of them, of the animals, but um, these, these uh, hyraxes do not have claws. They had these hoof-like nails, very similar to elephant feet. You can see a little tooth right there in the front. Um, they actually have tusks that grow from their incisors. Uh, unlike most animal, most animal tusks or fangs grow from, from canine teeth. Um, elephant tusks grow from incisors. Uh, and this is a view of the bottom incisors, but uh, the bottom tusks, but if you could see the top there, they're pointed just like uh, you'd expect tusks to be. When they, when they chew vegetation, they actually don't snip it off from the front like most rodents do. They just have to, they have to kind of grab it from the side. And also what they lay out in the sun a lot, they're unusual because even though they're mammals, they have they have trouble thermoregulating. So the one that was lying on the rock, that's a very typical behavior to lie in the in the sun for hours because they they need to absorb the heat. They have they don't regulate their own body heat very well. This is one of the heaths that uh, that grow on, up on Table Mountain. You can see the leaves are very fine. 
another probably pincushion type plant. This is a red winged starling, very pretty bird. Up on Table Mountain also. Then we came down from Table Mountain and went to the, the shoreline of the ocean. And uh, these are African penguins. They look kind of similar to Magellanic pengu penguins, which some of you might have seen, but uh, they don't have as many, they're missing one of the stripes in the front. Here's a cattle egret. Uh, these are uh, these are the same species that we have in the, in the U.S. Uh, however, they didn't get to the U.S. until until around 1940. They mi they migrated all by themselves up from South America, and prior to that, they weren't. I don't know when they got to South America, but they weren't there originally. They were they're originally African birds. They hang out with the with the, well, in domestic situations and farms and, and such, they, um, pastures, they hang out with the, with the ungulates, with, with cows and goats and other grazing animals. And they started out, um, you know, hanging out with all the different antelopes and other hoofed animals and foraging animals that are even elephants in uh, in Africa, they kind of wait for the animals to stir up insects from the vegetation, uh, which they then grab. This one is in breeding plumage with the with this beige coloring and the, the bright red beak and the bright eye, the red the red eye. That's not how they look most of the year. Uh, however, ours look like this in our spring, which is like February, March, April. And this was October because it was Southern Hemisphere spring. Some more Feinbos vegetation that I really loved. And this is actually on a beach. Um, at this point, we had moved up from Cape Town to uh, West Coast National Park. Um, And yeah, this is uh, this was on the beach. More oh no, this was prior one. This was probably not not the beach that we got to later. This was another uh, sandy area next to the ocean. Because this is back in the the botanical garden. This plant. And this was definitely the botanical garden. We saw this angulate tortoise, one of the native tortoises in South Africa. I don't know what this plant is, but it looks like these look like they will be seed pods. They're really puffy. And this uh, is apparently a tree aloe of another type got its own bark, but it looks like an aloe to me. So this was our, yeah, our last night in Cape Town. And before dinner, I took this sunset photo. And uh, you may be able to see this and this and this. So I didn't remember what these, I knew what these were at the time, but I didn't remember. I just looked it up uh, a couple days ago with an, uh, with an astronomy program that I have, an astronomy program I have on my, on my desktop. Uh, this is Jupiter, this is Mercury, and this is Venus. And interesting to me, being an amateur astronomer, they were setting in this direction, like kind of down to the left. And when you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you don't see that. You see your sunsets, the sun and the, 
stars and the planets, they go down kind of like this way in the west from upper left to lower right towards the north, sort of. And uh, so that's, uh, no, it's, uh, yeah, toward the north. Yeah. So it's reversed in the southern hemisphere. Kind of blows your mind. Here's a star map that I that I captured from my PC showing me Jupiter, Mercury, Venus at that longitude and latitude at that exact time in that exact year. Because as you know, the planets will not be the same year to year. Then we went up to the to West Coast National Park. And this uh, was a, a bird of prey way across a field. It's a black-shouldered kite. It's actually got, you might be able to see it, it's got uh, a, a rodent in its clutches, grabbed it by the back of the neck, and uh, life's brutal. Um, really nice red red eyed kite kites are ty a type of bird of prey if you're not familiar with them and it was it's on the small side here i am on the beach in west coast national park and over my shoulder is table mountain down in cape town you can see how flat it is you can see why they call it table mountain and out here on the beach are these plants that i fell in love with. However, I'm in love with just about any plants. Really unusual. This is incredible. Another one, very bizarre. And this one, Someday I'll look, look up what these are. Haven't done it. I did look up this one. This is a, this is really interesting. It's, this is a Harvea, I believe squamosa. It is, it has no chlorophyll. It's a parasitic plant. It, it has, it has roots that feed on other plant roots under the, under the sand. And uh, kind of, I guess, coincidentally, I um, I took a picture of a very similar plant in Portugal on the beach, and it was yellow. It's not in the same genus, but I assume it's the same plant family, and uh, it does the same thing. It's a parasitic plant. And here's one of the interesting plants, but. This is a familiar sight to a lot of you. It's a painted lady butterfly. We have these in the US. There are not that common in Florida. We have another one called the American lady in Florida, um, but there are, there are painted ladies in Florida certain, certain times of the year. And you see these, these butterflies all over the world. Uh, I've seen them <clears throat> just about everywhere. I've seen them in China. Um, I, I saw them in China near the Great Wall. Um, it's, they're just about everywhere. Here's another species of weaver called the Cape Weaver. Of course, it's in the Cape region. This is a pied avocet. Um, again, pied means black and white. Um, you might be, able, this is not a great photo, but you might be able to see the avocet upturned beak here. It comes way out and then curves a little bit upturned. And uh, all the avocets that I know of have beaks like that. There's an American avocet and there's a Eurasia, uh, European avocet. Also, Although it's not called European, I'm not, I don't remember what it's called.
And here are some lesser flamingos on the way to take off. They have to run a lot first to take off because they're so heavy. Really nice color. Speckled pigeon up in the tree. Rock kestrel. It's related to our American kestrel, of course. It's in the falcon family. It has a, a nice half-eaten half piece of prey in its talons. Here's another view from near where we were staying, looking across the field where I saw that the uh, black winged kite. And we've got three ostr ostriches walking away, two cattle egrets, the white ones, and then we have two, two lapwings on the upper right flying. Also on the shoreline, bar-tailed godwit. We have marbled godwits here in the US. Um, bar-tailed are, I don't think we see them here. I know they're, if we do, they're very rare. A lot of shorebirds do migrate and or travel around the world a lot. And uh, so you, there are lots of them that are wide ranging. This is my first time seeing a bar-tailed. Bar And the Wimbrel, uh, they're all over, um, very common in many parts of the world on shorelines. Distinctive curved beak. Here's Andrea looking out at some of these birds from a blind. However, in South Africa, they call them hides. And also any, everywhere in Europe that I know of, and Asia, they call them hides instead of blinds. Um, this one's set up really nicely with places to rest your elbows for your binoculars and cameras. And these windows can close. Uh, they, they can close, you can put, you can, they're like kind of shutters that close. Nice benches. We need a lot more of these in the States. And from that blind, we could see this southern red bishop on the reeds. There are some exotic bishops that have isolated uh, isolated territories, uh, isolated uh, populations in some parts of the states in warmer areas. Okay, so back to Johannesburg and just one photo there in the airport. I think Andrea took, Andrea took this one. There I am with Roz on the, on the right. Uh, there's Errol in the white t-shirt, our guide. And there's Mike. Um, this is where Errol, Errol left us. We were on our way to Zambia, to Livingstone, Zambia. Our next destination up here. So we stayed at this lodge and on the grounds, as I mentioned before, there's this plain zebra that didn't have the brown stripes very much. You can kind of see some very faint ones in here. And they were, they had free reign of this free, uh, they, they were free to roam the grounds as were some giraffes, uh, as were some impala, which is pretty cool. Uh, the first when we first got there, we took a walk over to Victoria Falls. On the Zambia side, uh, October is not the best time to be there because the flow is low. So you can a lot of this area, especially here on the right, would be covered with waterfalls in March or so. So we made sure to go to Zambia the next day. But in the meantime, here's an impala. And there were there were baboons walking around right on the path to the falls, right next walking right next to us. 
uh, they, they told us not to look them in the eye, not to challenge them, not to mess with them because they can be dangerous. They have very big fangs. And uh, so here's one nursing a baby. And this may be the same female with the baby walking on its back. I mean, um, holding its back as it walks away. Then the baby decides, well, I need to nurse some more. So baby drops off, stops the mom, goes underneath and, and gets some milk. This only lasted for maybe 10 seconds or 15 seconds. Mom says, you have a, you've had enough. Takes her left arm, scoots him back up on her back. I don't think he was very happy, but that's the breaks when you're a baby baboon. And on the Zambia side, again, uh, on a hike to the falls, we saw these shallows turcos. There are sp three species of turco in Africa, and this is one of them. It's in a very isolated area and nowhere else um, in this part of Africa, pretty much centered on, on Victoria Falls. The other turcos are in different parts of Africa, not connected. Here's another one coming in. And this is, you know, apparently this is a, a courting pair because they seem very interested in each other. Beautiful birds. Roz keeps saying they don't look real, they don't look real, but this is what they look like. Here's one that came closer for some berries. You can see they have these white, whitish uh, tinged edges to their head feathers. Now we took a sunset cruise on the Zambezi River, which divides Zambia and Zimbabwe. And actually that's where the, the falls are in a different part of the, of the river. And I saw this pretty large group of elephants uh, crossing the river. They were headed toward the bank here. And they all took turns leaving the bank, going up the bank of the river on the other side. There were hippos swimming near us. Here's a nice one that came close to the boat. Here's Mike and Roz welcoming, welcoming you to Zimbabwe the Zimbabwe side of the falls. Uh, there are statues to living to us, to Livingstone. Uh, David Livingstone was a British missionary and explorer in the, in the 19th century. Um, I just read a long Wikipedia article about him. Pretty interesting life. Um, so he was the first Westerner to see Victoria Falls. And so they have statues to him there. Kind of like that was the first person that mattered. But, um, and of course he named the falls Victoria Falls after Queen Victoria, who was queen at the time. And uh, of course the, the, the Africans had perfectly good name for it um, already. Something like Mosio, Mo, Moisio Tuna. And, uh, and so, you know, it's 
It's Victoria Falls now because of this guy. Uh, this is also the guy who supposedly was found by by uh, Stanley, another explorer who said he was going to go find Livingstone because Livingstone went missing, well, uncontacted by the West for a number of years. So he supposedly, when, when, they, when they met, Stanley supposedly said, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. That's pretty famous. Here's the falls on the Zimbabwe side, a lot more coming down. This is a blue wax bill, very cute little bird. We saw several places on the trip. Another view of the falls. Here's some, some stats on three famous falls. <clears throat> so just quickly, um, Victoria Falls is the highest. Iguazu Falls in Brazil, between Brazil and Argentina, is the widest by far. And Niagara Falls has the most flow. This is a nice plant. This is native to Africa. It's grown by American gardeners. I think it's called the blood lily, blood lily by American gardeners. Uh, it's Hemanthus. Hemianthus or something like that genus. I was just growing there in the woods. A giraffe on the grounds of our, our hotel, just, just laying there. When Ross first saw it, she thought it was fake, but we actually got out of the car and took pictures of it. Also on the grounds of the hotel, a banded, banded mongoose. And a pied kingfisher, another type of kingfisher. Spotted back weaver. Uh, I got a little series here of two pictures uh, showing him starting, apparently starting a nest by connecting to this, these, these pieces of grass to a twig. The next picture, you can see him moving to the right on the twig, having looped it around this little branch, these branches here, these, this Y-shaped. Um, branch. And so that's probably where he's going to be starting a new nest. Uh, yeah, and this is a spotted back weaver, which is a, it's actually a subspecies of the village weaver. And village weavers are called that because they, they create nests and colonies. And so here's one uh, checking out its nest and it's carrying some, some grass. And then it goes up to fortify the, the stalk, the strand holding the, that it had built, holding the nest to the tree. And here's a, just a look at some other spotted back weavers <clears throat> with the community, you know, the close, closely um, spaced nests. <clears throat> the closely spaced nests of the village village type weavers. And you can see this species even has little portals. So you they you have to crawl they have to crawl up this little tunnel before they get into the nest into the nest proper. So that's it. Goodbye Africa. This is Raz and me on, on Victoria at Victoria Falls waving goodbye. So Stephanie's going to come back on board. Here she is. Wow, Larry. <laughs> what a great program. Thank you. So many great pictures. I'm so happy that you shared with us. And I do have uh, questions and comments that I would like to share with you okay. uh, before we and at the very end um, well actually this I'll mention it now this slide that Larry is sharing uh, contact us if you have any email or Larry 
and there's some upcoming events uh, which you could read. And I will get right to the questions. So one of the first one is, are weaver birds considered tool makers as they construct their elaborate nests? Well, as you might know, uh, tool making among animals has come, I mean, human knowledge about it and opinions about it have come a long way. And because uh, it was first thought that humans were the only tool users then we found out that through Jane Goodall's work that chimpanzees could use tools like uh, could actually make their own twigs for getting ants out of a ant nest. And, and then we found other monk, other primates that actually could have learned to break nuts with rocks. Uh, of course, the chimpanzees are making a tool, uh, which is different from just using a rock. But anyway, Personally, I would say they're not using tools. They're just, it's a very sophisticated construction method and they're weaving the grass and, and reeds to make a nest. And that's what I would say, not, not particularly tool using. They're not using something else to make the nest. They're not using something else to put the grass together into the nest. They're doing it with their bills, my opinion. All right. Here's another one. What type of camera did you use? I used a Nikon D500. It's, it's so Nikon's, it's in Nikon's line of, um, they call them prosumer cameras. Uh, you know, that, that's kind of like the category below the one, below professional but above normal consumer use. And a lot of professionals do use D500s. Um, D500 is a, is a crop sensor camera, which means it's really good for, um, they're, they're particularly good for sporting events and for nature, nature photography that involves small animals, birds, et cetera, at a distance, because they actually give you a 50%, 150% the magnification um, of the view that another a full frame camera would give you, a full full sensor camera would give you. So it's good for that. And my lens that I've been using for the last couple of years is is um, well, it's a I'll show you the rig. It's a Sigma, it's, it's a Sigma uh, 150 to 600 lens. So with a Nikon D500, you get kind of like um, 450 to 900 effective zoom. So, and it's really nice lens for the money. Again, it's a Sigma 150 to 600. There is a couple models. There's a sports model, which is more expensive than the one I got. Next question. Excellent, thank you. Another one was, were you able to identify many of the birds yourself or was the guide uh, most, the one who was able to identify them most of the time? The great majority of these birds I had never seen before I hadn't studied the book very well, very much before the trip. Uh, so I didn't know the great majority of the birds. Uh, being a birder for about 20 years now, you know, I could, I could tell that this was an egret. You know, I didn't know what kind of egret. I could tell it was, uh, you know, unless it was the same as we have here, but um, I could tell some other categories of birds because we have similar birds here in the States, like in the similar bird families. But those are mostly like wading birds. And I mean, I knew, of course I knew, I can sort of tell uh, an eagle from a hawk, but not too reliably because they have some small eagles in Africa that might be mistake, I might mistake for hawks. And no, most of the birds I did not know. 
uh, when you're in a place like that, that you're not familiar with the birds, it's really good to have a guide wherever you are. Really good. It it's, makes a tremendous difference. Also, they know where to look for the birds. That's great that you had a, such a good guide then. And, All right, here's we, another. Victoria Falls, we didn't, well, we, we didn't, have a guide, didn't have a guide there most of the time, but actually we, a guy did walk with us over to the Zambia side and he was the one that pointed that uh, told me what the turcos, those shallows turco, those uh, green birds with the red eye patch, um, he told me what they were. Great. Here's another question that was asked. Did you observe any of these? And then the shoebill stork, pale fishing owl, or the light breasted roller? No. Um, I did okay. see a hammer top. I saw a hammer cop that I didn't have a, it's a wading bird that, um, it's a hammer cop. A hammer cop is a really unusual looking bird um, that I didn't get a good pic, good enough picture of. I have a, a blurry picture of it. Um, let's see, what was the, um, name those birds again quickly, please. Yes, oh. it's the shoebill stork. Yeah. Pale fishing owl or the light breasted roller? Okay. Didn't see the right light breasted roller. I'm just looking up the stork because. No, um, there's not a there's not a shoe bill stork here for South Africa. There's a saddle build stork. Uh, that's an incredible bird, very tall, red, black, and, and re red, uh, black banded, very large red beak, um, very interesting um, white and, and dark plumage. And I did see one from a distance. I did not have my camera with me. We were on a stop at Kruger National Park. Uh, that's a really impressive bird, but no, not a, sh I don't know if Shoebill storks are in South Africa because I didn't, don't see it in the book. And the, the book okay. is for Southern Africa, not just South Africa. <clears throat> so it would include Botswana and uh, Namibia probably. Next question. All right, I have another one, yes. Is the common cuckoo that you saw one of the species that engages in nest parat uh, parasitism? I think it is. Uh, I, I believe it is. Um, they don't breed in South Africa. They're, they, they're, they're, um, I don't think they breed there. I think they're there for, let's see. Mm -hmm. I don't really know the answer. Um, I, I believe it, I believe it is a, a nest parasite. I think, I think most of the cuckoos are. Yeah. All right, here's another one. Uh, this is about the long tail widow bird. Did you notice uh, different sizes of tails on the males? Um, did you that, see one or were there, was there a group of them? And did no, you saw a group of them? No, as far as I know, that that's the only one I saw on the trip. There may have been others I didn't get a picture of. Um, and a, uh, a quick comment was, I thought that it was interesting that Right now you saw them, they were getting into their different plumage, but I thought it was uh, interesting, a little interesting fact about them is how, although they aren't related to red winged blackbirds, they still have that same plumage coloration. Yeah, and I don't know With if there's the black any... and the red on the wing. Yeah, and I don't know if there's any reason for that. Yeah, sometimes it's like how the, the birds will evolve completely different parts of the world, but different pressures make them evolve similar uh, coloration. Yeah, or not, or not, and it just happens to be a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. You know, when you're talking about things like that, there's uh, people like to make up what I call just so stories, 
uh, but the stories aren't necessarily true. You can make up all your own facts if, that you want because nobody really knows the answer. That's true. And then another comment about the pin-tailed WIDA. Yeah. Um, have you heard about how they did experiments artificially lengthening and shortening their tails to see if females are attracted to the males with the longer tails? Nope, I did not hear that. So it was in one of my biology classes that we talked about that and they found that the females were indeed attracted to the males with the longer tails. So oh. it was cool seeing how you had a picture of that. All right, here's another question. For the crimson breasted shrike, did you see it impaling its food uh, on the thorns? I did not see that. I was lucky to get a picture of that bird. That they, I actually got a couple pictures in different places of the same species, but they're very quick in the trees. I don't, they don't act like the shrikes we have here in the states that I'm familiar with, which normally just perch one place uh, kind of a, towards the top of a tree and watch for prey. Um, this was moving all the time. And these categorizations like shrike and bush shrike and uh, they'll drive you crazy in places like Africa because um, these are names that were made up, some of them probably long ago. They may not really describe the bird, the group that the bird's considered to be in now. Um, you know, I'm not even really sure it's actually a shrike like the shrikes we have here in the States. It didn't really look, the configuration, the way it looked didn't look exactly the same. Okay, here's another one. For the greater blue-eared starling, which looked amazing by the way, did they create murmurations like the starlings we see uh, in the States? I didn't see any, I didn't see any flocks of them flying. So no, I, did, I don't know if they do that or not. Okay, um, another one is, uh, so it was something I noticed when you had the picture up with the elephants crossing the road, which was so cute, by the way, I noticed that there was traffic on the road. Was that something that you noticed a lot of traffic in the park in general while you were there? No. While we were there, there was not a lot of traffic, but it was there were cars coming and going during the day. It was, I'm not sure if we were there at a it, I wouldn't say it was a crowded time. I imagine it can get a lot more crowded. It, it, it wasn't a problem. Kruger, Kruger is huge. So there can be a lot of people in the park and you might not see any of them very much. Okay. Um, here is another one. So I noticed on the sign with the Cape Finebos area, that it's a World Heritage Site. And mm -hmm. some of those species look so strange and interesting. Do you know if they are considered some of the more ancient species of uh, plant life? Not as far as I know. Uh, they're, they're just very well adapted. As I mentioned, they've been, a, because the climate has been fairly stable there uh, as a kind of a, a dry climate throughout much of South Africa, different kinds of climates, but, um, but, but most of them on the dry side. And it's been so consistently that way that the plants have been able to um, evolve for a long time for those conditions and therefore diversify also. So it, you know, you just, um, it's just like if you look at human genetics, um, uh, humans started in Africa and were there for a long time before they actually, for tens of thousands of years before any, as far as we know, before any made it out of Africa to other parts of the world. And therefore the genetics in Africa are more diverse than, any, than, than anywhere else in the world for humans. It's probably similar for the plants. And the birds, for for sure, um, 
tremendous diversity there too. You know, mind blowing diversity. That's why having a, a guide is so helpful. Um, and as far as how ancient the species are, I really don't know. I, I would just say that, you know, they've been adapting to where they are for a really long time. All right, here's another question. Did you see any crocodiles when in the Livingston Park area or near Victoria Falls on the Zambia River? I know I have a couple pictures that, uh, of bad pictures of crocodiles and I don't remember exactly where that was. I, I probably wasn't the Zambezi, but I'm not sure. Another question is what bird was the most difficult to capture on film? I think that crimson breasted shrike I don't know if it was the most difficult, but it gave me the most anxiety because I really wanted to get a picture of that, of that bright red breast. And, and I, I, you know, I was freaking out about that. And I finally, I did get some decent ones. Um, let's see, hardest. Um, most of those would have probably been ones that got, the, the actual hardest ones would have been the ones I don't have pictures of <laughs> because they got away. And so were there many more that you saw that you took pictures that you just didn't add to the slides today that maybe even the pictures came out good, but you didn't add it? There are some. There are some good pictures I have of other species that I didn't include. Um, they weren't necessarily, you know, the best pictures I got, but they, they, I had some good ones, um, you know, of other species. So this isn't the whole thing. And as I mentioned, there's other birds I didn't get good pictures of that I do have pictures of. The the one I really kind of would have liked to include is the hammer cup because it's such an unusual bird. It's um, it's a gray bird with a, a huge like hammer shaped head. <laughs> but I didn't want to include the picture; it just wasn't good. All right, I have another one. Do any of the guides or even people that you saw in the parks seem concerned about population decline in any of the birds? Uh, no, I don't remember having that conversation. Um, okay. I, I don't know. Um, I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the next one was you saw many birds, and this might be a difficult question to answer, but what was your favorite being able to see? Any uh, life birds? <laughs> they were almost, they were mostly life birds. I mean, there were a huge number of life birds. Um, I, yeah, most of these were life birds, of course, of course. Um, <clears throat> You know, if you go across geographic barriers, you're gonna see more diverse, more different light, bird life than you saw, than you have at home. Um, so if you go to the West Coast of the US, it's often very different because you have the Rockies in the way, okay? On the East side of the Rockies, they're not as different. Um, if you go across uh, below the Isthmus of Panama into South America, the birds are really different. If you go even further south into, you know, Argentina, you might see a lot of different birds. So it's just a matter of geographic boundaries. And what better geographic boundary than a big ocean? So most of these birds were life birds. And to, for my favorite, um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I really like that Af African hoopoe. Wish I got a better picture of that for you, but I did get really good pictures of the ones in, that I saw last year in Egypt. Um, it was actually almost two years ago. Uh, I really like that that crimson breasted starling. I like the southern red bishop with the bright orange back. 
I really like that red-headed weaver with the orange. I guess I'm I'm uh, partial to orange and red. Oh, and the uh, the, the lilac-breasted roller, of course. Incredible. I love that one. Yeah. So there was lots of great comments, such as thank you for this presentation, fantastic pictures, as many of these birds are very shy. The barbet is an awesome looking bird. Um, fantastic photo of the leopard. The African elephants are huge. Um, beautiful pictures. World-class and inspired avian photography, many thanks. Uh, please, Larry, publish a book with your photos and commentary. Stunning photos. I agree. And thanks. one of my last questions is, do you plan on returning to other parts of Africa when things are safe again? Well, um, the most, the closest place that we're looking for um, a trip in the relatively near future, meaning the next couple of years, is possibly Madagascar, which is the big island right off Africa. And so we're looking into that. Um, we've, for a long time, we've looked at into going to like Tanzania and Kenya to see the, the big migrations of the wildebeest and the predators that, that follow them. Um, I don't know if we're gonna do that one or not ever. Um, so those are our main plans for Africa. There are lots of other great places to go in Africa to see stuff, including birds. I mean, I, I know that Botswana is good. Um, and so our main plans are for hopefully other places um, like in South America, Patagonia, um, places like that. So Africa, not, not, not a high priority in the, in the near future. Okay. Well, do you have any last words or comments before I go over this slide real quick and then we'll, we'll end our live stream? Um, All right, so if anybody once again has any questions, they can email us at Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society at G our Gmail account. If you have any questions for Larry, uh, remember you could rewatch this stream and if anything pops up, you could email Larry, he'll be happy to answer you. Some upcoming events, Orange Audubon is hosting the North Shore Birding Festival at Lake Apopka, which is next week actually, and you could still register and they are taking safety precautions, but it looks like a great field trip. Then the Kissimmee Valley Christmas bird count will be December 20th. So right now uh, there are precautions. If you are interested in signing up, please shoot us an email and we will get you the proper sign up information. Always check out our website, follow us on Facebook to stay up to date with all of our events. Now remember in December, we normally don't have any meetings and we will start back up in January. So stay tuned for our spring 2021 programs. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It was a great informational program and I want to thank Larry for putting everything together. So with thank that you, said- Thank you everybody for watching. Yes, thank you everybody. And with that, have a great evening everyone.